All right, guys. So <clears throat> I don't do this very often, but I have had a request. And there's a guy I'm talking to. Um, so far, our conversation, he, he seems very legalistic. Um, it's all about the law. We must be sinless. We must obey the law. We must follow the commandments. I've done several videos already and shared a slew of scripture and, and a slew of explanations. But this person is stuck in this frame of mind. And I now realize why they're stuck in this frame of mind. So I usually don't do this, but I'm going to do this. Uh, and this is the one and only time I'm going to do this on this conversation. Because if, if Curry, if you'd go back and look at my older videos, I cover this in massive detail with hundreds of scriptures that show and prove this point. Now, you've given me scripture you want me to look up. I'm going to look them up, but I, I'm going to show you where your error is because it's blatantly obvious where your misunderstanding is and why you're at that misunderstanding. First of all, when you listen to someone else and they say, here, use these scriptures, and these scriptures prove your point, and when anybody ever argues with you, you show them these scriptures, and that's going to shut them down. This is an improper understanding and an improper way to read the Bible. This is not rightly dividing. You can't take, you know, groups of scripture or, or, or pack, packages of verses from a couple of different chapters and a couple of different books and expect to prove a case. You have to look at them in context also. That's part of rightly dividing. So let's start in Jeremiah, which is the first one you asked about. And let me read these scriptures and then we're going to break it down. I'm going to show you where the mistake is. So Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. So, just with those four scriptures, I already know what you're trying to prove. See, it's the law, it's the law, it's the law. No, it's not the law, you missed a few key points. Behold, the days are coming. Now, true, Jeremiah is an Old Testament book, but here in a minute, I'm going to show you where he's talking about something completely different than what you're thinking. Uh, we'll make a new covenant with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you just read that, that says, well, there was a covenant when they came out of Egypt, but the new covenant is going to be with Christ. Exactly. But it's not the new covenant you're thinking of. It actually, the covenant that this is talking about is actually past that. It's not with Christ. It's past it. Let's keep reading and you'll see. Uh, Egypt. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. After what days? You've got to figure out what the details are. What days is he talking about? It's after these final days that we have here. It's after the tribulation. It's during the new millennial reign. Um, put the law, my law, in their minds and write it on their hearts. We have the law written on in our mind and on our hearts as Christians. That still doesn't save us by following it. You have to deny a couple of hundred scriptures to, in order to prove that. I will be their God. Their, um, now listen here, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. That is not existing right now, so you can't say that the new covenant is now. This is what will happen in the millennial reign, because Christ will exist on the earth then, and everybody walking the earth will know him. This is talking about during the millennial reign. This is when that new covenant with Israel is going to be made. So you have to read these things in context. Now, Let's go up, because you can't just take those four. You have to go up and read further. This is the mistake so many people make. Well, I'm going to take these couple of scriptures, and that sure sounds good to me, and I'm going to go browbeat a bunch of Christians with it. Let's read it in context. Uh, let's go up a little further here. Usually four scriptures, five scriptures is enough. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beasts. That's happened. 
And it shall come to pass that as I have washed over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. That's happened and is actually going to culminate in the seven-year tribulation. In those days thou shalt say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. That is the tribulation. Now let's go past. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So God is holding on to his promise. That way Israel has the promise. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. This is talking about the new the millennial reign. That's when that new covenant is going to take place because none of that stuff has happened. And the days aren't are not yet here where they're doing this for the Lord. See what see how I'm, where I'm getting at where I'm, I'm showing you a new covenant for Israel. We all have the new covenant for Christ. The new covenant for Israel will be in the millennial reign. And if you keep on reading, you'll see that. Now let's go to the other scriptures. We're going to do the same thing. Hebrews eight eight through thirteen. All right, so Hebrews 8, 8 through 13, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So this is likened to Jeremiah. But when you read this and go, see, look, they said it in Jeremiah, and now they're saying it in the New Testament, you got blinders on like a horse in a city. you got blinders on both sides of your eyes. Your focal point is, where can I find scriptures that seem like they prove me right, which these do not prove you right. Let's keep reading. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made, the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. What's growing obsolete and gro growing old? The law. That's why Jesus came and made that new covenant. This is the age of grace. That covenant is for that. There is a yet another one for Israel because he doesn't list the, the he doesn't list Gentiles, he lists the house of Judah and the other one. That's it. that's only Israel. This is a new covenant God will make with them. But the old one that that has that was done away with when Jesus died on the cross, that one is vanishing. That one is disappearing. That one is going away. A lot of people really love to resurrect it. And again. If you haven't, haven't clicked away, if you're still bothering to watch, again, if you think you have to live under the law, why aren't you sacrificing animals? Or are you? Because that's part of the law. So if you want to follow the law, like Christ said, if you're going to be a doer of the law, be a doer of the whole law. You can't pick and choose which ones you want to do and use the excuse, well, it's a new world. Nope, it doesn't work that way. Now let's read these scriptures in context. Let's go back up. Go up four scriptures. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. The, uh, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as... Inasmuch... Uh, where's it at? Lost my place. 
Oh, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. This is talking about the old law. In Christ we have a new covenant of grace. In the millennial kingdom he will have a new covenant with his people. Because he has to get rid of the ones who are stuck under the old law and refuse to do it. He did the same thing in the wilderness after he took them out of Egypt. So he has to bring all those people out, get the remnant and save them, which happens at the end of the tribulation. And they, all the Gentiles, the bride of Christ, all walk into the millennial kingdom. Then a new covenant is made with that remnant of Israel. You got to read it in context. You have to read all of it in context. And we have to, you have to dig into the details on this. Let's keep going. Remember, you wanted this. 16 through 17. So, Hebrews 10, 16 through 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It says the same thing. Well, let's go a couple of scriptures up. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, capitalized, so it's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, for after he had said before, then you have verse 16 and 17, which we just read. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. That's not just a random statement. He's speaking very clearly here. Now, where there is remissions of these, this is the new covenant of grace under Christ, there is no longer an offering for sin. Christ did it once for all sin. Period. It's in the scriptures. Christ died once for all sin. If that's the case, and there's no longer a sacrifice for sin, and there's no longer a requirement for that, why would you think the rest of the law would be a binding or a, uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Requirement. True, we know it. True, we have all that written on our hearts. Just like those scriptures say. But those scriptures said they were written on our hearts. It said nothing about this is what they must do. Details. You have to look at the details. Let's keep reading a little further. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not obeying the law, by the blood of Christ. It's all about what he did. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an everlasting conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This stuff here was not available under the law in the Old Testament. None of this. It was only after Christ died, nailing the law to the cross, per scripture, that we were unbound from those chains. We are no longer bound by those chains because under the law you are only allowed to do so much. Under the here's a great example under the old law, ten percent that's it, and that's all everybody gave. Now that we're no longer under that law, we don't. It's not ten percent. We're free to give all we want, where we want, how we want, when we want. Back then, it only went to the temple. That's how the tribe of Levi. They didn't have an inheritance. That's how they they ate. That's how they were clothed by the tithe. They God took care of them in that way. Now, everybody can do it as freely as they want to, as little as they want to, as much as they want to, it becomes now a personal worship, not a national worship. We're not under the law. If you're going to put yourself under one part, you have to obey every single bit of it. But these scriptures just said there's no more sacrifice for sin. So how are you going to be able to do that and still abide by the law? You can't. The scriptures deny it. Um... Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Under the law there was no hope. Bible says it. There was no hope. There was no salvation. There was a curse because of sin. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love 
and good works. Under the law, love wasn't prominent. You do these statutes and that's it. Under love, it's a whole different story. Under love, we're able to fulfill the law and more per scripture. Not forsaking the assembling of others, of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Is, why is it capitalized? It's the day of Christ. It's the day of redemption. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Now, you, if you stop there, like a lot of people do, then it's like, see, there's no sacrifice for sin. Well, first of all, you're not doing the sacrifices, so how can you be atoning for your sins? Christ took care of that. Christ didn't come and do part of the job. He did the whole job. But let's keep reading because the answer is further along. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. That's not for us. We have a fearful expectation of judgment because we know what sin is and we know because the law is written on our hearts. We know what God expects of us and what he doesn't want us to do. But yet we still know that we struggle with those things. But it is because of Christ we're saved. Because if we didn't have Christ, the law would still be prevalent and we would still be nothing but death under the law. Nobody who died under the law went to heaven. They all went to Abraham's bosom. Jesus confessed that. Annas confessed in the Old Testament. They could not enter to heaven. There was no redemption. There was no redeeming blood. They were still in their trespasses, even though they did animal sacrifice. All they did was cover it, but it was still there. They waited there until Christ died on the cross. And for that three and a half days, he went down into the belly of the earth. He went to Abraham's bosom. He collected them and brought them back out, took a bunch to heaven with him. And then other ones went back into their bodies and their graves broke open. It's in the scriptures. And they went into this town and presented themselves. There's actually historical documentation on this, that it happened. Yeah, they won't tell you about it. you got to search for it. You couldn't do that under the law. But now when you die, if you're in Christ, you go to heaven. Your spirit goes and dwells in heaven. Your body goes into the earth. Save for the day of redemption. Got to read everything. So anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how, and that was back then, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Well, how do we do that? By trying to live under the law and saying Christ's blood is not good enough. See, this is what happens when you read further. You don't just take the scripture somebody tells you to use against other Christians, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, because the Bible says we shouldn't be doing that to each other. But when you do that, oh, let, let me take those scriptures, and I'm going to go use them against somebody. When you do that, you condemn yourself. When you read four verses up and four verses down around those scriptures they, they, they told you to read and use, you learn the truth. And we're going to keep reading to the end, because I want you to get this. If you can't get this, then there's nothing I can do for you. Because it's not me you're having the problem with. It's the word of God. Of how much worse... So anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That was under the law. Now, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who is our salvation... Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, which is what we're covered by and what God sees when he looks at us, not our sin nature, and insulted the spirit of grace, which is the Holy Spirit. So if you're trying to live under the law, you are doing those very things. Because now you're basically, you're telling God, what Jesus did wasn't good enough. I need to do more to save myself. You can't save yourself. If you could save yourself, Christ didn't need to die on the cross. All he needed to do was come down and go, hey guys, Here's, a, here's the rules, here's the guidelines, I'll see you in 2,000 years. And back up he went. He didn't need to become born in the flesh. He was a spiritual being in glory. He laid his glory down to come here to do this for us. So he could be an understanding advocate between us and the Father. And to give us the ability to have access to the throne room, which formerly under the law we did not have. That's why the veil was there. You ever wonder why the veil ripped from top to bottom when Jesus gave up the ghost? Because that was God clearing a path to man. Now man has full access 
to the throne room and the tabernacle. Don't listen to these other people. They don't know what they're talking about. They're not reading scripture. They're getting just enough to hate on people and you're falling into that same trap with them. Don't do that. I've checked out your channel. I see the videos you liked. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You need to be careful of the ground you're treading. It is a dangerous place. All that think like you. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggling with sufferings. Listen closely to what he's saying here. If, you've still, if you're still here and haven't clicked away, which most, most have, listen closely to what he's saying here. Party... Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Under the law, they would have put them guys in prison. What Christ is saying is, don't worry about it. That's not an issue anymore. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. This goes to the video I just did. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, what is the will of God? We looked it up. Covered it in a few videos. The will of God is that all believe in Christ, and so they can have salvation. After you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, not the law. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. It is all about faith and believing, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is not about the law anymore. You cannot fulfill the law. No one can fulfill the law. The apostles even admit they could not fulfill the law. If they were chosen specifically, and they admitted that they were sin, full of sin and could not obey the law, and Paul even, or yeah, Paul even rebuked Peter for going back to the law, and many of the other Pharisees that had been converted were going back to the law, and they were all rebuked. What does that tell you? It's not about the law anymore. Now, as a Christian, our lives, when we walk more in the Spirit, our lives naturally progress to that level of understanding and that level of living. Those things are good for the flesh because you're abstaining from things that you don't need. But it, God is far less concerned with what you do in this flesh than what's going on with your spirit. This is what's important. Because this is in here is what's going to go to heaven. This flesh is going to turn back into dust. He's not concerned with dust. What you're doing in this flesh is far less concerning as to what's going on with your spirit. And if your spirit and your heart are not right, if they're, you're not in the full trust and assurance and full belief and faith in Christ, there is a big problem that you're going to deal with. And I'm doing this video because I'm a watchman and I'm sounding the alarm and I want you to hear this. If you can't see it after this, there's nothing else I can do for you. Because the Word of God explains this very clear. And the very scriptures you tried to use to prove your point and prove me wrong actually got flipped back on you and proved you wrong. The new covenant that's coming for Israel is in the millennial reign. We have the covenant of Christ right now, which is the new covenant for all people. Got to go read the details. You can't just take a couple scriptures and say I'm right. You have to read everything about the subject. So please dig deeper into this. Don't let... Don't follow other people's videos. Don't believe me. I gave you this, the, the examples. I showed you how to look this stuff up. Somebody gives you one, two, or three verses. Go read the whole chapter that pertains to that verse. Then you'll get a full understanding of what's being talked about. Because just taking a few out of context can be twisted and wrung out any way you want. But when you read them in context, whole different understanding. So that's my challenge to you, Curry. Go read more. Don't just trust what somebody gives you two or three scriptures. Read the whole chapter. And you must see and understand that this is the age of grace, not the age of law. The age of law was 2,000 years ago and back. The promise of salvation through a Savior was given to Abraham almost 500 years before the law even showed up. That was the first promise. We're living under that right now. 
So you got to look at the details. you got to dig out the details. Now, if you still disagree, that's fine. You can disagree. But the Bible is clear on this. Not the scriptures you're showing, because I just flipped them around by reading them in context and showed you what it really means. It's about faith. It's all about faith. And for 2,000 years, it's always been about faith. And if you're trying to do it yourself under the law of the commandments, thinking you're sinless, you have a very, very rude awakening coming. And I feel bad for your situation. So I love all you guys. If y'all stuck with it, Curry, if you if you stuck with it the whole time, I hope you get something out of this. But this is the end of the conversation because I can give you scripture till I'm blue in the face, but if you refuse to see it, there's nothing I can do for you. And it's not me you're upset with, not me you're arguing with. It's God. Love you guys. Bless y'all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next one.